This is uh, about 15 minutes I'm going to talk. Uh, for people that doesn't know me, I'm Werner van Wijk from Police Roads and Transport in the Free State. I've uh, been working in the department for 33 years. I started as a assistant to a surveyor, did my studies and so on and continued and now I'm acting. But as you know in government, most of the time we are acting <laughs> and some or other posts, so uh, yeah, that's one of, one of the items. Um, just for a presentation, if you look at the table of contents, uh, we have a purpose of the presentation. We will look at the background, past and current project budget and expenditure that we have, past and current project classifications, uh, summary, current status of uh, the network, um, future, let me just close this window here. Okay. Future uh, workload, quality of engineering services, and engineering in COVID-19. So purpose of the presentation is to basically present to CISA the current and future infrastructure projects and its execution in the free state. So if you look at background, the uh, Department of Police Roads and Transport is the custodian of the provincial road network and it includes the bridge structures also on the network. According to the Div Division of Revenue Act, uh, through the aid of the Provincial Road Maintenance Grant or PRMG grant as we call it, we are responsible for the following, but it's not limited to that. To improve the road safety, with a special focus on pedestrian safety, to improve the condition and uh, lifespan of the provincial road network, to improve the rate of employment and community participation through labor intensive construction methods, and the skilling of people also, delivering a road network or on road network infrastructure projects. The grant, which is the PRMG, PRMG grant, which is a supplementary grant to our normal funding, uh, helps us to invest in our road network and to maintain it. And it is basically used in routine, periodic and rehabilitation maintenance projects. So if you look at expenditure per grant for 1920 and 2021, um, just to state that uh, if you take a comparison of our grants, and we all know the PRMG grant is supposed to be um, add-on to our own grant that's received from our provincial treasury. We, in the free state have, depends about basically 94% of the time on a PRMG grant, and we're basically getting 6% enhancement allocation which is from our own treasury so most of our projects if not all is basically budgeted and expenditure is on the ground so we have been fighting for several years and we continue on fighting to have a 50 50 spread between the enhancement allocation and the prmg grant but yeah that's one of those items that keep on now, if we look at the grants that we have available in the 1920 financial year, we had the EPWP grant of 11.5 million, which we spend 100%. In the 2021 financial year, we have a budget of 7.5. I think it was also reduced to the covert. So, um, everybody had to take a cut to provide for COVID uh, pandemic. Um, so all our budgets was had basically a cut on them. If we look at enhancement allocation, the IEA, we had 428 million in the previous financial year. That includes salaries and um, internal maintenance teams and so on and some projects. Of that, we spent 82%, but we actually spent 100%. Uh, 
Um, the challenge was that there wasn't enough finances or cash available to pay all the contractors by the end of the year. And that meant that we had a cruise that were run over to this financial year. For the 2021 financial year, we have a budget of 409 million, which has already been cut uh, for the COVID, of which we spent from April up to now 63.5 million. That gives you 15% of uh, the grant being spent. On a provincial road maintenance grant, we had 1.39 billion previous financial year and we spend it 100% on all our projects. For this financial year 2021, we had 1.447 billion, which was cut down with two, 219 million to 1.228 billion for this financial year of which we already spent 105 million up to now on this financial year and it gives you a total expenditure of 9%. So we have lost about 100 and, or 380 million around there uh, to cover it in this financial year. If we look at the past and current projects that we are running by classification, we had a total number of projects of in 1920 or 45 projects that is in the roads. Um, we also had a number of 48 projects in 2021. On our EPW P projects, we had 1926 and in 2021, 14. That is your most labor intensive projects. Um, then on routine maintenance projects, that's your patchwork, um, reseal and so on. We had seven projects in 1920 and in nine in 2021. Periodic maintenance is reseals and other maintenance works. We had three projects in 1920 and one project in 2021. Special maintenance projects, which is basically rehabilitation in certain forms, is our largest projects except for upgrades. Uh, the challenge is that with the budgets that we receive, we cannot accommodate a single project for the whole financial year. And the amount of money that a contractor can expend on the project outside in the felt is also limited. So we normally spread projects over two to three financial years. So a project will basically occur three times or twice uh, over three or an MTF period. So on special maintenance, we had 18 projects and in 2021, we have 15. On the upgrade projects, uh, that is where we improve the roads, widen them, do climbing lanes, et cetera. We had eight projects in 1920, and we have five projects in 2021. Uh, RAMs, or Road Asset Management Systems, and Systems Projects, we had three projects, and for this financial year, 2021, we will have four. We have basically added safety projects to the list of projects that we have there, uh, because it's one of the compliance items of DORA. So if we look at the current status of our network <coughs> in a free state, uh, the network in a free state comprises of paved and unpaved roads as normally. And uh, there you can see our five districts where Lewa Lepuchwa, the second district from left, is the district with the highest kilometers of paved roads, which is the black bar. Now, the gray bars that you can see on all the provinces is our tertiary roads. Now the tertiary roads, due to budget constraints that we have, we do not work on these roads anymore. We have basically, they are still with us under legal compliance. The, they have still uh, servitudes registered, etc. but we don't do any maintenance or any works on them. So the works are basically done by the farmers themselves. So we concentrate with our budgets that we have mainly on the black bars, the paved kilometers, 
off-road and then on the orange bars, which is the gravel roads, the secondary road network that we have, um, which we do regraveling and uh, blading works. Our current status for our paved road network. <clears throat> uh, we have had our uh, road asset management unit do overall network conditions and where the condition overall, if you look at the graph, you see the last bar there, you have R1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the last bar, the overall bar, indicates that we have 50% poor and very poor. That's the red and the purple, if you put them together. So 50% of our network is in poor to very poor condition. This was about two years ago at 65%. So we're working in the right direction. Uh, we're decreasing the poor and the very poor, but we must not forget to look at the fair and the good. The fair roads, if you do not start addressing the fair roads, you will have an issue eventually that they all end up at poor and very poor and uh, will create just a cycle which you will never get um, or reduce your poor to very poor roads. So if you look at the last overall, uh, we have 5% very good roads, 13% poor roads, 32% fair roads, 38% poor and 16% uh, or 15% um, very poor. If we continue with the current road network status, we will look at uh, the network condition number. So overall, the network condition number uh, is 47, which is low. It means that our uh, road network is still in a poor condition um, when we have a lot of work to do. If we analyze it according to the RCAM classification, you can see on the graph the yellow bar there that indicates that the R2 roads is on a best condition if of classification and that is at 50%. While the poorest classification, which is the R5s, is at 48.8%. So our classifications between the different roads does not differ a lot. So it indicates in short that our whole road network is still in a poor If we look at the maintenance and rehabilitation strategy that the Free State or the Department of Police, Roads and Transport has adopted, it is a five-year maintenance plan strategy where we have prioritized our projects or road network based on the structural, the functional and surface conditions of the network. Other contributing factors that we have taken into account is the traffic volumes, strategic economic roads and road safety appraisals, which was done. Um, I think we're the only province in the, f in the country that has done that, except for KwaZulu Natal. So, yeah. Uh, the strategic strategy seeks to generate employment, which we all know our job creation needs to increase and to enhance the economic growth of the free state. To to provide a safer road network. Furthermore, the department has developed a road asset management plan uh, that takes into account in the documentation the nature of the road, the age of the road, the extent, utilization of the road, the condition, performance, and value of the road as it is in the field. Finally, a life cycle cost analysis is performed on a yearly basis to take our by budget that we receive and see what is the best that we can do for the amount of money that is available. What will be the best balance? And that is how we will then get to our list of roads and um, projects that we have to do for a financial year. If you look at a future workload uh, for consultants and contractors, 
The department is currently expediting infrastructure projects by means of internal capacity, therefore bringing the cost saving to consultant fees. Now, the con internal capacity is fine, but what we have found also is that we have too much work for the limited number of project managers and people that we have. So it was a good item to look at uh, for a certain time period, but it doesn't look like it will be sustainable. Um, consultants will then be needed um, to make it possible for us again to function normally. Even when uh, the need is identified, the engineering consultant service will be procured through our supply chain processes and procedures to ensure that the work is distributed fairly and across the board. If we look at quality of engineering services, the department is capacitated with officials that supervise internal maintenance teams. That's our own people, uh, as they called them PAO previously, or PAO. And then um, we are also having the same people look at the external projects, which is funded by PRMG funding, which is done by contractors. The supervision of internal teams are somewhat ne neglected as their activities are repetitive and the team size is also shrunk, uh, causing limited production. So with our own people, as I explained now, that we're utilizing for the external projects also, it is that we are concentrating much more on the external pro projects because of uh, the amount of work that is expected from a project manager to manage a project. More focus is placed on KPI projects, which is the capital projects and the large money than on the OP, uh, OPEX projects. If we then go further and we look at the covert procedures that we have put in place in the free state of our department, as our projects was running smoothly and then everything had to stop and we had to rethink the whole situation. All road construction contracts currently is adhering to the Department uh, or the Occupational Health and Safety Act, Act 58 of 1993, and its regulations, in particular the construction regulations of 7 February 2014, number R1010. The implementation of the National Disaster Management Act in combating the COVID-19 pandemic resulted in various regulations and restrictions that had to be implemented and which was additional in procedure to what a contractor, small contractors and subcontractors normally put in place. And this the contractors had to do to prevent or limit the spread of the virus on site and also for the well-being of their employees and their own staff. The additional regulations and restrictions to, the adhere, to be adhered to by the contractors are as follows. Submissions for the revised OHS plans had to be implemented uh, and the process of COVID-19, which earlier was is detailed as the plans, in their plans as follows. Providing relevant and additional PPE for laborers, masks, gloves, overalls. Um, this is all additional to what you normally have in PPE on your sites. Providing sanitizers and wash basins where applicable. So we had to establish sanitizers, wash basins, and so on, where people are eating, where people are on site, where people are at the offices, and so on. Screening of laborers on a daily basis. This meant that laborers had to be screened before they enter the vehicles for transportation to the sites. So in the mornings when the people were arriving at, let's say, the taxis, which will transport them to sites, the people would have been scanned and checked before they enter the vehicles. The vehicles was also 
looked at to, if you had about 30 people that you need to transport, you will then have divided the, the group of people into groups of 10, and only 10 people would be transported in a minibus seating 16 people. So that depended also on the covert regulations that was in place and restrictions at that stage, which meant that the, uh, it was 50% or 70% depending on what time period uh, we were talking about. We are still applying the 70% at the moment. Um, we cannot afford to have a, a person on, on site that has covert and then the whole site had to be closed. Disinfection of work areas, that's offices and sites outside, equipment that is utilized, plant uh, that is utilized, disinfection of plant between different operators when they take uh, the plant out, and the transportation, as I said now, had to be sanitized. Allowing for social distances at work areas and, and in vehicles, this is a challenge. Um, not all activities uh, allows you to have social distancing. So some activities we had to change over to from labor intensive to machine uh, so that uh, we could have social distancing or where it wasn't possible that the people could then uh, uh, not be on a, in a group. Furthermore, if we look at procedures in dealing with infected persons and quarantine procedures on site, on all sites, offices and on sites, we have a certain area or an office that's been put aside for quarantine. A person would then, if a person is found to have covert or a high temperature or so on, he would be taken to that area until the Department of Health arrives so that they can take it from there. The same thing with procedure of phasing or restart of labor. Uh, it basically comes down to that um, with us also in the offices, basically a third of our people are at work. The other third people uh, with comorbidities People older than 60 years are not at work and uh, they are on special leave. So where we had people outside on the sites in the same circumstances, they are also on leave, so they're still getting paid. And we had to work with less labor than we had before. So with the pro pro procedures implemented on all sites, that would include all stakeholders. This means that we have taken everybody, the community, the CEOs of the companies, of the construction companies, and everybody into account. And we have had meetings of all of them so that they all understand the same processes and are stakeholders in this whole project. And in each and every project. So that everybody is clear on what happens and how it's done. We have also gone the additional work to get your local based health authorities on to par so that we have a communication with them and they are also part of our project management teams and see and is able to oversee that we are adhering to the OSH operations on site. And that is my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and I thank you.